gather for the dressing of an Elizabethan lord. Welcome to the Society of Creative Anachronism. The SCA is a worldwide recreationist movement and the largest of its type. We've been active for over 50 years worldwide and 30 years in Australia. We are interested in anything up to the end of the 16th century and today, brought to you by the Kingdom of Lockhart and the near baronies of St. Florian de la Riviere and Riven Haven, with the largesse of the Abbey Medieval Festival, we will be drawing the veil from the mysteries of the bedchamber of a lord in the time of Gloriana herself, Queen Elizabeth I. Please welcome our lord. Huzzah! The most excellent Baron Dmitri Borodinsky, recently risen from his bed and wearing a loose gown and cap to keep him warm while his attendants prepare his attire for the day. And of course, our Lord's attendants of the bedchamber. Our Lord's attendants weren't just professional friends. These were trusted as discreet messengers, state spies, household accountants, personal stylists, and were just generally entertaining people to have at parties. <laughs> Let me introduce you to the most important of his servants. Lord Theophrastus von Oberstockstall, the first lord of the bedchamber, is known as the groom of the stool, and it means exactly what you think it does. <laughs> the groom spent time with the king in his privy chambers and was the most trusted of his lord's attendants. His word was considered as evidence of the lord's will and favour, which could be used to his great personal advantage, making this position highly sought after. Lord Theo is today wearing a simpler version of the doublet and trues that our Lord will soon wear. However, the quality of his fabric is well above that of other attendants. Thank you, my Lord. Lord Eamon McLaughlin would have been one of a number of manservants in a household who would perform duties chiefly relating to the person of his master. The most common term for this role is gentleman, manservant, or simply just man. For example, in Romeo and Juliet, Benvolio refers to Romeo's ever-present servant as his man. A servant and master strive to do each other credit. As a gentleman of quality, it befits your dignity to dress your servants well. As a servant, you do your master credit by looking and behaving well. <laughs> Lord Eamon wears garments gifted from his lord's wardrobe, which are much higher in quality than he would otherwise be able to afford. Well, um, pardon me. <laughs> now we call forth our Lord. In the interest of brevity, the comfort of our Lord, you see he is already wearing his undermost garments. Huzzah! Sorry, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> These include a linen smock, a simple garment, a version of which has been worn by both men and women for generations. The smock was the most easily washable of all the layers, vital at a time when bathing was infrequent and considered dangerous to one's health. The garters were of course required to help keep one's stockings up, but garters were also considered something of a personal favour or gift. The Order of the Garter, still in operation today, was created in 1348 and is the most senior order of knighthood with its appointments at the Sovereign's sole discretion. Underwear at this time consisted of greys, a linen garment made of three rectangles and tied with a drawstring. The first layer we shall add begins with the padded roll. The puffiness of a man's pants and a fine cut of leg was an aspect of fashion that was much appreciated at court. However, the weight of the paint panels required support. Therefore, a padded roll was added to the hips to help support the weight of the many layers of fabric in the pants. With the roll in place, the next layer is the paned slops. The slops had many sundry names during this period, including nether hose, Gallagher skins, or ponderhosen, and are the most iconic image of the Elizabethan era. They consist of at least four layers of fabric and could be a couple of kilos in weight. Often the name of the slops changed according to their length. Slops which were very high on the thigh were referred to as trunk hose. Medium length, as we see here, were commonly called plonderhosen, which is my personal favourite to say, and longer below the knee were called breeches. This particular style of kalunderhosen is often referred to as pained slops, whereby the outer pants are slashed to show the richness of the lining fabric beneath. 
Originating in the 14th century, as the fashion for short tunics became popular, the codpiece was invented to cover the gap at the top of the hose and were originally just a small triangle of fabric. Coming into the late 15th century, they grew in both size, <laughs> embellishment and popularity and were a distinct fashion statement of Henry VIII. However, the Elizabethan period was also the sunset of the codpiece as while they were still an elaborate accessory, they slowly went out of fashion. <laughs> we now move on to the doublet. The doublet is stiffened and fitted to hold tight to the body, and we can see that Baron Dimitri has certainly embraced the fashion for buttons. <laughs> buttons were a common usage in England and Europe by the early 13th century, and some would put this date as far back as the 9th century. In Elizabethan times, they were often cast metal buttons, constructed from various metal elements which were either stamped or embellished. <coughs> As I mentioned before, the weight of the pants could be quite considerable. To ensure that they stayed in place, the pants were tied to the doublet. These ties were hidden under the peplum of the doublet, and while holding the pants up, also pulled the doublet down and improved the line of the whole outfit. Sleeves were separate items tied onto the garment and were considered fashion accessories, interchangeable between outfits and worn in varying styles. They may have been matching or complementary to the doublet and trues, but were just as likely to be made of strikingly contrasting fabrics. Within the 16th century, sleeves started to be integrated into the doublet, as we see on both our manservants. While he fiddles about, a little note about this uh, codpiece. Uh, they also functioned as a useful little purse. That's a little room in there. Uh, for storing precious items like coins or jewels, and tradition claims this may be where the expression a man's family jewels comes from. <laughs> and now for my Lord's footwear. Indoor shoes were typically leather, square-toed and without a noticeable heel. But boots were more commonly worn for outdoor activities and riding. Buckles came into fashion on shoes and boots during the later Elizabethan era. And as usual for men's fashion at the time, the more the better. <laughs> The Lord's men now pin on his livery collar or chain of office. Worn as a sign of fealty, the livery collar was presented to ministers and courtiers by the person they were swearing fealty to. This particular collar is denoted with the symbol SF, which stands for Semper Fidelis, Latin for always faithful or loyal. These collars have never really gone out of style and are still worn by Lord Mayors and others as a sign of their office to this day. The definitive Elizabethan accessory, the ruff, is worn at both the collar and the wrists. Ruffs are separate pieces added in the later stages of dressing. In Elizabethan times, neck ruffs could reach great heights and often needed to be supported with wire frames to maintain their structure. This one is a relatively simple ruff for the time, made of linen and lace. At least three metres of fabric were needed to achieve this lovely statement of fashion. And remember that lace was handmade at the time and very, very expensive. So this was also an extravagant display of an individual's wealth. And incredibly difficult to tie on today, apparently. <laughs> Incidentally, uh, if you saw our presentation earlier today, we uh, dressed a lady for the court, and they have a different style of neck ruff that pins to the collar and stays open. So if you see pictures of Queen Elizabeth, they're the type that she would wear that would frame her whole head. You're looking very fancy, my lord. <laughs> As usual. Carry on. Strict sumptuary laws issued by Queen Elizabeth dictated that no one other than knights, barons, and men holding high rank in the Queen's court were permitted to wear spurs, swords, or daggers. Therefore, if you were of this rank, it was essential to wear a sword so that all would know you were a man of quality in the eyes of the Queen. My Lord's sword belt also holds his pouch, 
a sturdy leather pocket featuring a few more of those very fancy buckles. We'll all just wait politely while you fiddle. Very nice. Next is the cloak. Cloaks were worn by Englishmen of almost any station. However, for the gentry, they were worn short, more as decorative cloaks. Not for warmth, but for show. Such cloaks were decorated with gold trim pearls and fur and were tied across one shoulder as so. The dashing explorer, Sir Walter Riley, reportedly displayed his gallantry by sacrificing his plush velvet coat, laying it over a puddle in front of the Queen so that her royal feet should not be sullied by the wet mud. Thus enchanting the Queen, he became one of her firm favourites. Now for my Lord's finishing touches. Jewellery was loved by both men and women. Popular jewels of the time were diamonds and pearls, as well as emeralds, rubies, coral and opals. Gems would be set in gold or silver according to the wealth of the individual. The Elizabethan era saw an influx of exotic goods arriving from all over the world, including luxurious, never-before-seen perfume ingredients. Explorers brought vanilla, pepper, cardamom, sandalwood, clove, and delicious cacao. Many were used for flavouring, but also found their way into fragrant creations. The Elizabethan fashion dictated that the head should be adorned with a hat. And the size of a man's hat often indicated the size of a man's wealth and social standing. As you can see here, our Baron's hat is very tall, and this was the forerunner to the fashion of top hats. Now my lord is ready to attend his day at court, suitably arrayed in appropriate garb. <laughs> On behalf of the Society of Creative Anachronism and the Abbey Medieval Festival, I hope you have enjoyed this glimpse behind the curtains of my lord's bedchamber and can appreciate the lengths to which our many reenactors go to share with you our love of history. Please thank our models here today, Baron Dimitri, Lord Theo, Lord Eamon, and behind the curtain, helping with our items today, Lady Heliana. If you'd like to come and talk to our Lord and his attendants about any of the clothing you've seen here today, or if you would like to take some photos, please feel free to join us in front of the wagon here for the next few minutes. Thank you for being a wonderful audience and please enjoy the rest of your day here at the Abbey Medieval Festival.